Chapter 11 At some point, some time later, Paul must have been in his office, because Meltz came in. She asked about where some forms or other were kept, though what had given her the impression that Paul knew where they might be, he had no idea. He didn't answer. He was all out of words. She repeated the question a couple of times, and then said, Paul, are you all right? Uh, uh, what? I said, are you all right? Honesty, the best policy. Wasn't that what his mum had always told him? Good joke. <laughs> uh, no, he replied. Melts looked concerned. Bless her compassionate heart. You look awful, she said. What on earth's the matter? Q enormous grin. Oh, just just found something out uh, about me, my life, the, the world in general. <laughs> no big deal. That didn't seem to satisfy her. In fact, she sat down with a let's talk about this look on her face and said, You're acting very strangely, Paul. What's all this about? Extend grin. <laughs> you really want to know? I wouldn't be asking if I didn't. Fine. Paul folded his hands on the desk and sat up straight. Uh, you met my mum and dad a few times, didn't you? Yes, of course. A look of alarm occupied her face. Nothing's happened to them, has it? They're all right, I mean. Funny. Oh, <laughs> they're all right. They're as right as bloody rain. I got told something about them. That's all. Just a tiny flicker of impatience in among all that warm-hearted concern. What? Paul pursed his lips for a moment. Not the sort of announcement you want to rush. Uh, you know they retired to Florida, Meltz nodded. Well, Paul went on, I just found out where they got the money from. Oh, she waited, then prompted him. Was it something bad? <laughs> you could say that. They sold something. Sold something? What? Me. Meltz looked at him as though he'd cracked a tasteless jork at a moment of great solemnity, like a christening or a funeral. I don't understand, she said. Don't you? <laughs> it's very simple. They took money in exchange for me. <laughs> for my life. But they couldn't have. There's no such thing any more. Well, they say it still goes on in India and places, but not here. It's illegal. <laughs> so are lots of things, Paul said placidly. Murder and stuff still happen every day. But, she scowled at him, don't be so bloody aggravating, Paul. Lose the melodrama. Tell me exactly what happened. I just did, he sighed and leaned back in his chair. They sold me to the firm, this firm, J.W. Wells & Co. 425,000 US dollars, he frowned, excluding VAT, presumably. Didn't ask about that. Don't know if people are zero rated. But, 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 Mills seemed fond of that word suddenly. But why, for crying out loud? Uh, why did they sell me, or, or why did JWW buy me? Oh, well, both. Paul shrugged. Well, the, the first one, because they're utter bastards and they wanted the money. And the second bit's rather more complicated and I don't want to bore you. Paul. Oh, please don't say Paul in that tone of voice. You remind me of my mum and that's not tactful. All right, here goes. My Uncle Ernie, right? The one who died. Uh, yeah, that's right, the one who died. Turns out he was one of them, one of us. Good at magic, strong in the force, whatever. He was really good at it, apparently, and according to Countess Judy, the sort of magic stuff he was best at almost always runs in families. She explained it to me, <laughs> but I wasn't really listening. Uh, seems there's charts and tables and whatnot, and you can work it out really precisely who in the family is likely to have inherited the gift, if that's the word I want. Seems that Countess Judy and the other partners did the maths and decided that I'd be a good investment. So he looked at my mum and dad and made them an offer they couldn't refuse. Paul grinned disturbingly. Not that they tried all that hard, it seems. Countess Judy said she and the rest of the gang got the impression that mum and dad would have settled for a hell of a lot less, like a five of cash and a bag of dog biscuits. But according to her, there's, there's rules of professional ethics and that mean they have to make a fair offer to start with. She did tell me how they arrived at the figure, something about 30% of the income they'd reasonably expect me to produce for them, multiplied by two-thirds of the number of years I retire. I'm sure she was telling the truth. She's got an honest face, among others. Meltz didn't say anything for a very long time. Paul, she said, you're not making this up, are you? <laughs> no, no, come on, be reasonable. You've known me for years. When did I ever make have that sort of imagination? Meltz looked like someone had just slapped around the fierce with a large sea bass. But they can't hold you to it, she said. They can't. Paul shook his head. <laughs> Don't you believe it, he said. Look, I... 
I told you about how Dennis Tanner made puppets out of Sophie and me when we tried to resign, and that was just on the strength of a contract. Well, when they've bought you outright, it's far, far worse than that. Among other things, they can kill me. <laughs> just like that. But the police can't arrest them for killing someone who drops dead of perfectly natural causes, <laughs> like a heart attack or a blood clot in the brain. It's not my body anymore, you see, so it'll do precisely what they tell it to do. Not that they're likely to kill me just for wanting to quit. <laughs> I cost them too much money. Besides, uh, all they need to do is tell my body to show up for work every morning, and that's exactly what it'll do, whether I like it or not. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> anyway, that's my bit of news. How's things with you? Uh, but, please... Paul interrupted. I know you're trying to be nice, but I'd rather you didn't. I think I've stopped believing in nice for the moment. And if you stay here, I'm going to say something really horrible. I know I won't really mean it, but you'd have to take that on trust. Besides, you've got that stupid form to find. Mel stayed right where she was. Are you sure it's not just Countess Judy winding you up? She said. I mean, she doesn't seem the type, but you never know. Did she, well, give you any proof or anything? Paul stifled a yawn. Well, she showed me the bill of sale, all properly signed and witnessed. Do you know they got hold of Mrs. Bath Patterson from next door to witness their signatures? I hope they didn't tell her what the document was about. It, it fried her brain. But Meltz was struggling. He could see, trying to find a loophole for him, something to give him a tiny crumb of hope. He should have found it touching and sweet, but all he felt was irritation. You told me you saw the job advertised in the paper and went for an interview. True, but the questions they asked me were gibberish. According to Countess Judy, that was to see if I freaked out easily, but no, I just thought I was too stupid to understand what they were getting at. They'd got it all carefully arranged. I only saw that advert because Mum and Dad told me the best place to look for jobs was that particular newspaper. The whole interview thing was a set-up. But it couldn't have been. They hired that other clerk at the same time. The girl. Chloe. <laughs> Sophie. I, I guess they must have set her up too, Paul added. That hadn't occurred to him before. She told him her mum and dad had highlighted the ad in the paper with yellow marker pen, so she couldn't miss it. Uh, uh, look, I really don't want to talk about this stuff any more. Uh, last night, he frowned, last night Countess Judy tried to kill me. She'd have done it, probably, if Ricky Wormtoter hadn't stopped her. Kill you? But why? Paul shrugged. And is she going to try again? Uh, Paul, for crying out loud! Uh, the answer is, he said, I don't know. Don't bother asking me the question, whatever it is. I, I really do think you should go away now. But go away! Meltz left. For a long time, Paul just sat, his mind in neutral. He was trying to remember something that had occurred to him. Yes, right. Wicky Wormtorter had saved his life, apparently. But Ricky was a partner in the firm. He'd been at the interview. So he must have known the whole deal, right from the beginning. Another cheerful thought. How could they do that to me? They're own son. Not that it mattered. Evil, unspeakable bastards, like every other living thing on the planet. $425,000. What did that come to in English money, anyhow? Paul shrugged. It sounded like a lot, but hadn't he found all those hidden bauxite reserves, Mr Tanner, just by looking at photos of blank bits of desert? Maybe he'd already earned out what they'd pay for him, in which case no wonder Countess Judy regarded him as nothing more than a Kentucky fried soul on legs, handily in reserve for the next time she needed a midnight snack. Talking of which, he was feeling painfully weary. Just ten minutes ziz was all he wanted. And could it possibly matter now, if he slept and dreamed and never woke up? Paul thought about the fairy tales that had scared him so much when he was just a kid. Stories about young men who get lured into the fairy castle and wake up to find it's a hundred years later and all their family and friends have died. What was it Ricky had said about people dying in their sleep? Not that he was in any position to believe anything Ricky said at that. Ricky Worm taught her. I trusted that bastard. I gave him the last of my coffee. And that posh stuff he bought me tastes horrible too. I ought to be fucking angry about that. Depressing, really, that I'm not. If I went to Florida and killed them both, strangled them with my bare hands, I'd inherit the four and a quarter hundred thousand dollars, assuming they haven't frittered it all away on garden makeovers and soft furnishings. That'd be no more than justice, because that way at least I'd get the money that paid for me. Not that money's any good to me. Besides, killing them would mean having to be in the same room as them. I don't think I could face that. And I'd have to ask Mr Tanner for time off. And he probably only lets you take your holiday if you're dead. Ricky wormed toward her. The door opened and Ricky came in. Today he was well-groomed and elegant. Pierce Brosnan modelling Armani. Not a hair out of place, no scars or bruises. He had a large black box file tucked under his arm. 
It wasn't often that Paul felt an urge to use the word smarmy. Right now, though, he reckoned that it had evolved its slow, painful way from Anglo-Saxon through Middle English to its present meaning just for this very moment. Ricky smiled and said, Hello. Hello, Paul replied. How are you feeling? Tired? Well, that's understandable, Ricky said, with a viscosity of sympathy you could have poured on flapjacks. No return visits, so. No. Ricky's frown was so slight that most measuring devices wouldn't have been finely enough calibrated to detect it. That's good, he said. I said, didn't I? She wasn't likely to try again right away. I guess that means we've got a little time. <laughs> she explained about that. Paul said grimly. Apparently she found someone else to murder, so I'm off the hook for now. I expect you're glad, he added. After all, it's your money too, isn't it? Seventy thousand dollars. Ricky looked genuinely confused. What about seventy thousand dollars? Six partners, Paul said. Six into four hundred and twenty-five thousand is seventy thousand five hundred. Eight hundred and thirty-three, actually. Ricky pulled a sad face. She told you about that then? Calm. Always calm. Yes, Paul said. She told me. Oh. He paused and then shrugged. You wouldn't care to consider the soccer transfer fee analogy, I suppose? Not really. Thought not. And you aren't flattered, I guess. No. Ricky grinned. You should be, he said. And if it's any consolation, it's a good sign for your career prospects. He put the file down on the desk and sat in the chair. Sophie's chair, of course. Shows how highly the firm values you and all that. I couldn't give a flight. They only paid 25000 for me. Paul couldn't remember what he was about to say, even though he was in the middle of saying it. Instead, he froze with his mouth open. Mind you, Ricky went on, that was when 25 k was worth something. We're going back a few years to when money was something you could melt down and turn into jewellery. Even so, with due allowance for inflation and the underlying trends in the industry as a whole, I was cheaper than you when I was your age. And I'm sure you know better than to go telling anybody what I just told you. It's one of those deadly men's locker room secrets that you don't even share with your best friend. Paul was still staring, but his mouth was back on line. They, they own you too? Not say, Ricky said with a sad smile. We, oui. as you so astutely pointed out just now, I am one of them. Which means that I own a sixth of me? Well, a twelfth if you take the bank's share into account. But even a twelfth of yourself is better than... He shook his head. For a twelfth of me, I've worked seven days a week, 547 days a year. 500... Uh, Ricky smiled. In a magical environment, the term time and a half takes on nuances you couldn't even begin to imagine. The point is, I survived and I'm still here. Dragons and vampires and animated skeletons and office politics notwithstanding. If I can do it, so can you. It's tough, but this is a tough business. Besides, he added, scowling fiercely, Judy was entirely out of line trying to cull you like that. Clause 15 of the partnership agreement is absolutely clear. Partners must not use the firm's assets in such a way without formal consent at a properly constituted board meeting. He glanced at his watch and stood up. In fact, he said, this time I think she may have finally gone just too far enough, if you see what I mean. In which case, we've got her. Thanks, he added graciously. To you, of course. It'd be better if we had something in the way of proof other than your word. Still, it's a start. Paul shook his head. <laughs> That's all you're interested in, then? Booting her out of the partnership so you can work your way up to the letterhead, is that right? Ricky nodded. Partly, in fact, mostly. There's also this small matter of her trying to have me killed for the past 116 years. But I flatter myself that I'm big enough to overlook that. He paused, hand on the door handle. Oh, and one other thing, he said. I guess I owe you an apology. Quite, Paul thought, and on the same scale of values, the attack on Pearl Harbor was a bit uncalled for. Uh, really, he said. Yeah, your portable door. You remember you lent it to me, just before I, well, anyway, I'm afraid I haven't got it anymore. It was taken from me when I was in the dungeons. They gave me back the rest of my stuff when they let me go, but not that. I'm sorry he added. I'd replace it if I could, but it's not really the sort of thing you can buy in Lakeland Plastics. It was some time after Ricky had gone that Paul noticed he'd left his box file on the desk. Paul picked it up and a typed memo fluttered out from under the lid. Paul, 
Thanks for minding the fort for me while I was away. By and large, you coped pretty well. However, work has been piling up rather, and I'd be grateful, since you're still officially part of my team, if you'd deal with a few odds and ends for me. Routine paperwork, mostly. I'll drop JDCB a memo explaining that you'll be working for me for the next few days, as she's now your nominal head of department. Ricky. And in handwriting underneath, P.S. I'd clean forgotten, but today's my birthday, and in case nobody's told you, we've got this corny old thing where on your birthday you buy cakes for everyone in the office. I know you like Uzbek, so yours is honey and nut pakava, Tashkent style. Enjoy. Sure enough, inside the box file, along with half a dozen fat brown envelopes full of papers, was a white paper bag, partly transparent with oil and honey, inside which was some sort of sticky pastry thing with bits on top. Paul couldn't see any reason why it should be poisoned, and he'd missed breakfast, so he ate it, but not in such a frame of mind as could in any way be construed as forgiveness. Tasted all right, though. Work, Paul thought. Well, why not? He opened the top envelope, a thick wad of forms, most of which he recognised. Form JX775, application for a special licence to cull banshees on a site of special scientific interest. Form JK981 open brackets, B close brackets, application to remove a tree preservation order from a rogue entry, form JG663, special dispensation to burn the corpse of an undead in a smokeless fuel zone. He sighed, reached for his pen and yawned hugely. So Ricky had lost the portable door. Pity, it'd been an amusing toy, at least to begin with. Paul had been able to spend week-long lunch hours in exotic places and had still managed to catch up on his work before the front office opened again. At one point, he'd honestly believed that it helped him attain true love, in a confused, untidy sort of way. Possibly it might have come in handy in his present ghastly dilemma. Maybe he could have escaped from Countess Judy and the fear through it, next time they came for him. But he doubted that. You had to be awake to use it, after all. On balance, it was no great loss. He'd learned before that the door's principal and fatal drawback was always that you took with you every time you stepped through it. Namely, yourself. Paul shrugged and added it to the list of magical goodies that had recently passed briefly through his hands, along with the Sea Scout badge, the Wyvern's brainstorm, Uncle Ernie's stash of bizarre stuff that Mr Tanner's mum had whisked away from him on the pretext of making the world a safer place. Yeah, right. Come to think of it, he had lost, given away or mislaid enough potentially devastating weapons to equip a small but very nasty army. If he believed that it probably wasn't a coincidence, would that make him certifiably paranoid? On balance, probably not. Paul finished one lot of forms and found another lot in the next envelope. JJ409, application to renew a helmet of invisibility licence. JF006, statutory notification of intent to destroy a ring of power in an environmentally sensitive area. Filling them in gradually lulled him into the accountancy zone. That dazed no man's land between sleep and waking, in which nothing seems to matter except writing the answers to damnful questions into cramped little printed boxes. Even as his mind drifted away into the fog, he couldn't help wondering if the Fay could operate in this disputed border country, and at some level he was relieved and pleased when the phone rang and jerked him out of it. The phone ringing was something of a novelty in itself. <sighs> Hello, he mumbled. Outside call for you, Paul recognised Mr Tanner's mum's voice, wondered vaguely why she was filling in on reception, and remembered that Meltz was a cashier now, even though Benny was presumably free too. Did anybody tell you that you're not supposed to take personal calls during office hours? What? Paul said, but the phone clicked in his ear, and then someone said, Hello, Paul? Uh, hello? He recognised the voice. Of course he recognised the bloody voice. He heard it nearly every day. Paul, it's me. Demelts or Horrocks? Melts. Pause. You don't remember me? Uh, huh? Uh, of course I remember you, Melts. What? <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> um, I know it's a bit strange me ringing you out of the blue like this after all these years, but last week I ran into Jenny Wheeler and she said Neville Connolly had told her you're working at this place in the city, which sounded really sort of grand and impressive, so I couldn't resist ringing you up and seeing how you were. How are you? Uh, uh, M Mel's, I is that you? Pause. Oh, <laughs> very funny. Same old Paul. Anyhow, long time no see. Did you hear I got married? That's right. Well, you remember Damien Turnbull? His sister was going out with this bloke, Sean, and then they broke up and I happened to run into him at a party and... Pointless trying to listen, absorb information and have the world blow up around you all at the same time. Paul tuned out. 
It sounded like Mel's. Fact was, it sounded a hell of a lot more like Mel's than Mel's did. And it was dropping all the right names. The people they'd been at school with, the friends of the friends of their friends. But Mel's was only a staircase and a few yards of corridor away. So what was she doing ringing him long distance from the deep past? Mel's, he interrupted. Where are you living these days? Saffron Walden, she replied promptly. Well, just after Kevin was born, we decided it was time we got out of London. And then Sean got a transfer. Saffron Walden, Paul repeated. Look, um, excuse me asking a very strange question, but uh, what made you decide to call me? Right now, I mean. Didn't I just tell you that? About running into Jenny Wheeler, who told me Neville Colony had... Right now, Paul repeated firmly, as opposed to last Friday or tomorrow week. Did you? Battle-hardened and soul callous as he'd become, he still cringed as he said it. Did you have a dream about me? Pause. You know, that's absolutely amazing. Yes, I did. Not a strange dream or one of those dreams. You just happened to be there in it and it made me think, I wonder what ever happened to poor Carpenter. And then I bumped into Jenny Wheeler and Superdrug and she said Neville Connolly. That's great, Mels, Paul said. I'll call you back. Bye. He sagged back into his chair and dropped the fawn onto its cradle. Then he glanced at his watch. Quarter past three. He'd worked through lunch, apparently. At that moment, Meltz, must get out of that habit, the fake Meltz, would be at the bank, peeing in the checks. Good, he thought. I should just about have time. As Paul stood up, he felt strangely energised. Well, he thought, at least I've figured out what's been going on around here. The fact there's nothing I can do about it is another matter entirely. It was cold and slightly damp in the strong room, just as it had been when Paul and Sophie had catalogued the contents, somewhere between three months and a thousand years ago. Much of the register was written in her spiky, difficult little girl handwriting, and Paul found that enormously distracting. Bad, since he really did have to concentrate. As he had assumed, Countess Judy hadn't written register entries for the Wyvern's third eye stone she'd taken from him, nor had she simply shoved it into the shelves where the catalogued items ended up. On the other hand, he was morally certain that she must have stashed it in here somewhere. Why he was so sure, he had no idea. Logically, she could just as easily have hidden it in her own room somewhere under an invisibility glamour, or logged it somewhere in the post-relativistic vastness of the closed file store, or in any of the countless hiding places in which Seventy St Mary Axe was undoubtedly riddled. Or she could have gone for absolute maximum security and stuffed it on the front of her blouse, like a madam in a western. Logic, though, hadn't exactly been on his side ever since he first walked through the door of this hell hall. Could a Vulcan survive on the premises for more than a fifth of a second, Paul wondered, before his green brain boiled out through the pointy ears? Almost certainly not. The thing was in here somewhere. He knew it. But where? When searching for proverbial needles in proverbial haystacks, there's always the robust approach. Set fire to the hay, then sift through the ashes with a metal detector. Such an approach wasn't likely to endear Paul to his employers terribly much, but he wasn't really too fussed about that. If they chose to fire him for it, yippee. But they weren't going to, because that would mean kissing goodbye to 425,000 bucks. In any event, he placed a slightly higher value on his life than on his job, and pissing off Mr Tanner would be fun. He closed the strong room door behind him and went to reception. Sorry to bother you, he told the ice-blue-eyed Swedish blonde bombshell behind the front desk, but I need a favour. Mr Tanner's mum scowled at him. You've got a nerve, she said. Several, well, she shrugged. What can I do for you, she said. I need to borrow some of your friends and relations for a few minutes. Don't be bloody stupid. So Mr Tanner's mum replied, and she was about to remind Paul of the fundamental deal whereby the goblin stayed strictly out of sight during office hours in return for the run, scamper, slither, crawl, waddle, of the place once everybody had gone home, when he shushed her. It's an emergency, he pointed out. I need at least two dozen goblins for maybe ten minutes. Is that such a big deal? If she hesitated, it was probably only for show. What for? she said warily. Research, Paul replied. Fair enough. Where do you want them? Ten minutes proved to be a wild overestimate. Mr Tanner's mum's sisters, cousins and aunts were through the strong room in four, leaving behind a snowstorm of floating and paper, shredded envelopes and viciously abused index cards. Sorting and clearing up was going to be the sort of job they'd have all the king's horses and all the king's men sulking in their barracks, screaming for their shop stewards. Not, Paul thought smugly as he cradled his matchbox in his arms, my problem. Is that the lot? asked the boss goblin. 
Yes, thanks. Oh, pity. We could do upstairs for you. No worries. Five minutes. Paul shook his head. That'll be fine, he said. Or there's a closed file store. The goblin persisted, hopefully. We aren't allowed in there unless one of you tall bastards lets her eat it in. You, you sure you haven't accidentally lost something in there? A paperclip or, or two PPs or something? No, really, Paul said firmly. But thanks ever so much for offering. The goblin muttered something under its breath, then whistled to its chums. They all glowed electric blue for a split second, then vanished. Paul allowed himself a moment or so to gaze at the majesty of the spectacle before him. According to his parents, his bedroom had been, beyond all possibility of comparison, the untidiest place on the planet. <laughs> Not any longer. For a connoisseur of the shambles beautiful, it was an awesome sight. A small part of him hoped that the clearing-up spell the partners used every morning to straighten up the aftermath of the previous night's goblin frolics would suffice to deal with his mess. The rest of him could not care less. Back in his office, Paul carefully opened the matchbox. There was the storm, still looking uncannily like one of the bits of coloured glass you get in a flame-effect electric fire. He closed his hand around it, then hesitated and opened his desk drawer. Sellotaped to the side was a list of in-house extension numbers. He found the cashier's office and dialed. No reply. Not Mel's was still at the bank. Fine. On his way to the cashier's room, Paul stopped off at the closed file store and headed for the shelves where Benny stored the heavy-duty pest control gear. Since he was on a roll with wanton destruction, he was tempted by the comprehensive selection of explosive devices and accessories, but in the end he decided to keep it simple and discreet, and helped himself to a crowbar, a hammer, a couple of offcuts of two by four, and a bag of nails. Plenty enough to carry up two flights of stairs, three if there was an R in the month, offhand he couldn't remember, and not so noisy as to risk attracting unwanted attention. It did cross his mind to see if Ricky Wormtorta was in his room, but he decided against it. Paul still wasn't sure about Ricky. True, he seemed to be mostly all right, but he was still management. Paul reckoned he'd be better off on his own. The first part of his plan wasn't too hard, although woodwork had never been his strong suit, and he caught himself a nasty blow on the thumb with the hammer. That gave him the time he was going to need for the tricky bit, the first part of which was breaking into the filing cabinet. Tricky was about right. When the crowbar snapped in half like a stick of celery, Paul seriously considered going down to reception and asking for a loan of another six dozen goblins. He dismissed the notion. The partners were bound to have specifically goblin-proofed every bit of office furniture in the place, so even the relentless energy and imagination of Mr Tanner's off-relations wasn't likely to do him any good. There were always the explosives, but by now he had a nasty feeling that the rest of the building was likely to give way long before the filing cabinet lock. Hitting it with the hammer would achieve nothing beyond a temporary alleviation of his frustrations. Apparently he was screwed after all. Unless... Surely not. But what the hell, it was worth a try. Paul opened the top drawer of the desk and looked inside. Sure enough, along with the statutory broken pencils, twisted mess of tangled rubber bands, spilt miscellany of paper clips and whirls of discarded extra strong mint wrappers, was a little chrome-plated key. Just for kicks, he tried it in the filing cabinet lock. It turned. Something went click, and the drawer slid open as smoothly as a politician lying. Fine, Paul thought, as he took a deep breath. Now for the really tricky bit. Muscles stiffened, teeth clenched, he peered inside. His first reaction was, shit, no wonder the bloody thing was so heavy to shift around. A spiral stone staircase, just as you'd expect to see in a church tower or the keep of a medieval castle, led down from the lip of the drawer into a huge gloomy hall, dimly lit with rush lamps set in wall sconces. Paul hesitated for maybe five seconds, then, brushing aside a file divider marked A to C, he scrambled into the drawer and started to descend. He had the key in his pocket, just in case. It'd do him any good if someone came in and slammed the drawer shut. He also brought the hammer and half the broken crowbar. If he got trapped down here, would anybody think to look for him? Just possibly, yes. After all, his name did begin with a C, and all offices everywhere are founded four square on the principle of alphabetical order. It was dark. Paul hated spiral staircases. There were almost certainly rats, not to mention spiders. For the first time, he genuinely felt like a junior apprentice hero. Not that that was any comfort at all. In fact, it was right up at the snow-capped top of the list of things he didn't want to be right now. Nevertheless, just for once he had a plan. Not a very good one, in all probability, but still a plan. 
All junior apprentice heroes have plans, the way teenagers have spots. He pressed on until he ran out of steps and then stopped. Someone was staring at him. He could feel it. You again, said a vaguely familiar voice. Uh, uh, Hello? He hated the sound of his voice at that particular moment, reedy and feeble and indescribably silly. Uh, uh, Where are you? I I can't see. (laughs) All right, in that case... Green lights seeped through from all directions, showing Paul a scene that he recognised straight away. A long green fire ran the length of a broad Hollywood medieval hall, orc panelled and hammer beam roofed, painted and gilded. Polished tables and carved benches flanked the hearth, and the walls were masked by acres of richly coloured tapestries, a grotesque combination of flowers, wildlife, court and battle scenes. At the end of the hall, a high table crossed the tea. Paul swung round, but the staircase wasn't there any more, needless to say. Idiot, Paul muttered to himself. Idiot, idiot, idiot. Now you know where you are, said the little girl, stepping out from the hidden side door. Didn't expect to see you here again. Last time you couldn't wait to leave. Behind her were the rest of the gang he'd first encountered at the all-night garage of the Forest of Dean. The same nightmare blend of cuteness and horror. Stephen King moonlighting as a script editor for the Brady Bunch. Great plan, Paul thought. Now what? Uh, uh, Sorry, he muttered. Uh, Wrong draw. Um, I was looking for D.E. You couldn't possibly point me in the right direction. A freckle-faced boy grinned at him. D's in dungeon. Sure, we'll take you there if you like. (laughs) Uh, Thanks, Paul said. But actually, I was uh, after E for escape. Then you're out of luck, the boy said. Definitely out of luck, in fact. Please abandon all hope in the receptacles provided. He took a step forward. And if you think your horrible friend with the claws and little red round eyes is going to burst in and save you again, you can forget it. We've upgraded the security since you were here last. He pointed to something above Paul's head. Paul craned his neck and saw something small and metallic, flashing pale green light nailed to a crossbeam. The Sea Scout badge. No need to ask how that had got there. Nevertheless, Paul had a feeling that the loathsome kid had committed a tactical error in drawing his attention to it. Apart from that one step forward, the gang hadn't moved. He was prepared to bet, not that he had any choice, that as long as he stayed underneath the badge, they weren't in any hurry to come closer. At best saw, it was a stalemate. Not that it matters, the girl was saying, but what on earth prompted you to come back here? (laughs) She giggled. Is there anything we can do for you? Paul forced himself to smile. (laughs) Actually, he said, there is. You can answer a few questions for me, and you can give me back something that belongs to me. Is that me all right? The boy grinned. Depends, he said, on whether you've got anything to bargain with. We don't think you have, and don't think you can stay safe forever just standing under that stupid badge thing. Sooner or later, you'll pass out from hunger or fall asleep on your feet. We're patient. Paul shrugged. (laughs) Fine, he said. While we're waiting, answering my questions would help pass the time. But what be the point? Face it, if you've been here a few days or months or centuries, whatever it is that's occupying your funny little mind will have lost any trace of significance long ago. (laughs) You think you'll care who planted the bomb or who the traitor inside JWW is when the only thing you can think about is how wonderful it'd be if only you could die. Humour me, Paul said. The little girl rolled her eyes. Whatever, she said. Fire away. After all, we don't have to answer you if we don't want to. But in return, she added slyly, You'll have to do something for us. Something we can't force you to do. Okay. There's things you can't force me to do? Some. Not many. What's the first question? It took Paul a moment to remember. Maybe little Miss Poison had a point. Already none of it seemed particularly important. Who's Grendel's aunt? he asked. All the kids except the little girl sniggered. She just looked at him as if he was simple and said, You don't know? No. Amazing. All right, then. Grendel's aunt is the queen. What, of your lot? Countess Judy? The girl nodded gravely. The Contessa Judith de Castel Bianco. As you've probably guessed, the Contessa thing is just slumming, like God dressing up as the Pope. But yes, she married some tin pot human nobleman when she first broke into your side of the line. She needed a human cover, and your lot are so impressed by titles and stuff, she reckoned it'd give her more credibility. Before that, she was just a, uh, uh, what's the word for it, someone who sings in a theatre, along with a lot of the other human females. Chorus girl? Like it matters, but to answer your question, she's Grendel's aunt, and this is her home, and principal place of business, and the dungeons are hers too, of, of course. 
Uh, thanks, Paul said politely. Uh, so who is it pretending to be Mel's Horrocks? One of you? The girls smiled. Queen Judy's niece, she replied. Princess Susie. Out of interest, how did you find out? We all thought she was doing a really good job. Uh, yeah, she was. But the real Mel's phoned me out of the blue. Otherwise, I don't suppose I'd have known. Interesting, the girl said, poker-faced. That raises some implications we're going to have to consider carefully. But that's our business, not yours. One more question, and that's your lot. One more question. And they didn't have to answer it if they didn't want to. The Civil War thing, Paul said. What's it about exactly? I mean, are there genuine issues, or is it just that you don't like each other very much? A bit of both, the girl replied. Yes, two-thirds of us can't stand the other third, and vice versa. But what sparked all of it off was the big colonisation debate. The majority liked the idea of crossing over to your side and settling there, like when your Europeans come to America. But there's few fuzzy-minded types who don't hold with stealing territory and exterminating the indigenous wildlife. Mostly, they're just a nuisance. There's, there's just not enough of them to constitute a problem, and they're way too wishy-washy to do anything effective. The only reason we haven't done the invasion stuff before is that we couldn't get across the line except one at a time every now and again. Uh, great for building up our intelligence gathering network, um, useless for large scale troop movements. But then you showed up and we got hold of that wonderful portable door contraption which means we can finally start a full scale takeover. All thanks to you with some help from that clown Ricky Wormtota. <laughs> the irony is, she continued, he only borrowed the door off you in the first place because he was convinced it wasn't safe leaving it with you. As <laughs> soon as his back was turned, we'd get hold of you and prize it out of your cold, dead fingers. <laughs> so he took it, thought he'd lie low for a while, somewhere we couldn't find him. <laughs> Not a bad idea, actually, provided you haven't got a mole in your support structure. <laughs> As it is, we were there waiting for him. Stupid, arrogant human, thinking he was a match for us. Once we got him in the dungeons, it took us about five minutes before he was practically begging us to take it, if only we'd let him go. <laughs> we agreed. Uh, we were lying, of course, she smiled. And, and that's your third question, and I hope you feel much better now that you know the answers. Right now, though, you're feeling very, very sleepy. Annoyingly, she was quite right about that. When Paul woke up, his first instinct was to roll onto his side and reach for the light switch. But there wasn't one. And then he remembered. He wasn't at home in bed. He was in the stronghold of Judy de Castel Bianco, Queen of the Fae. Again. He was just about to scream with fear and anger when he remembered something else. <laughs> yes, he was screwed. But he had a plan. So that was all right. Assuming he could remember what the plan was. Yeah, he couldn't. It's a miserable thing to have a tea bag memory riddled with thousands of tiny holes through which information floods out. Paul had lived with the affliction for so long that he generally managed to rise above it. He wrote things down on scraps of paper, or tied knots in his handkerchief to remind him that he'd tied knots in his other handkerchief, or stuck yellow stickies on doors and VDU screens to remind him to check his handkerchief. Forgetting something as big and important as the plan was, however, seriously careless even by his standards assuming that was, that he'd actually forgotten, rather than having had strangers inside his head editing his memory. Good point. The impression Paul had got from the kids back in the Great Hall was that he'd been deliberately put to sleep, as opposed to merely flaking out through exhaustion and caffeine deficiency. If they'd put him to sleep, it almost certainly wasn't for the good of his health. Pound to a penny he'd been having dreams while they'd been asleep, and while they'd been inside his head, what would be easier than wiping the odd memory as they passed through? Bugger, he thought, but he rallied quite quickly. He had no idea what the plan had been, but if he'd made it up in the first place, it couldn't have been anything too clever or elaborate. If he'd managed to invent it before, then surely be able to invent it again, from first principles if need be. Piece of... unless, of course, the plan hinged on some specific piece of kit, which he'd carefully brought with him, only to have the fair pinch it from him while he was asleep. That wasn't so easily shrugged off. Paul checked the contents of his pockets, keys, crumpled switch card receipts, pen capped without company in pen, handkerchiefs with knots, 37 pence in loose change, wallet, ball of frayed string, his battered old pen knife, official girl guide issue, his 12th birthday present from Auntie Chris, one unwrapped and extremely sordid fruit pastel, one small chunk of what looked like the glass out of a flame effect electric fire, fat lot of good. No, Paul remembered now. He'd been at great pains to get hold of the small chunk of what looked like glass. It was, of course, silly him, the third eye of a Suffolk round spot wyvern, prized out of the poor dead creature's skull by Mr. Tanner's mum, confiscated by Countess Judy, restored to him by two dozen extremely improbable goblin boy scouts. 
Since he'd incurred so much aggro to get hold of it again, it followed his night the day that it featured substantially in the plan. But how? All it was good for was research, finding out marginally relevant facts about chimeras. Look in it, Mr Tanner's mum had told him, and you might just see something useful. Fine, Paul thought. What would be really useful right now? He grinned sourly. What he needed to know as a matter of urgency were the details of the plan, just in case he'd actually managed to think of some way of... The stone grew, from a loose chipping to a potato, to a basketball, to a boulder that filled in all the space between floor and ceiling, until it was so big that he couldn't see it any more. Deja vu, Paul thought, with a brief spurt of wild hope. Cool. The green glow was warm and crackled softly with static. Please wait. As before, the glow resolved itself into a shimmering, insubstantial blackboard, on which words started to form like frost crystals on a window pane. The plan. It occurred to Paul that he hadn't breathed for quite some time, since the storm came online, in fact. Never mind, plenty of time for breathing later. Nor, since it's likely, certain even, that I'll be caught and my memory will be wiped, I'm taking the small chunk of what looks like the glass out of a flame effect electric fire along with me. With luck, they won't notice it in among all the other junk in my pockets. Then, when I'm trapped in the dungeon, all I'll have to do is look in it, and with more luck, there'll be a copy of this plan, and then everything will be just fine. I hope. Fingers crossed. Fine, Paul thought. Clever, resourceful old me. Now, about the plan. Please, weird. Stupid stone. Paul did his very best not to get impatient, but it was hard going. Quite apart from the fact that the plan was his only hope of not spending forever in a very small dark room with himself for company, but he couldn't wait to see how clever he'd been. The memory you are looking for is currently unavailable. Your cerebral cortex might be experiencing technical difficulties or you may need to adjust your physical surroundings. Please try again later. (laughs) Paul thought. Now, about the plan. The plan. Thank you. Thank you so fucking much. Paul read the wispy white letters once, twice, three times for luck, a fourth time just in case he was being really thick and had missed something painfully obvious that would explain everything. Then he shrugged. Of all the people in the world to be forced to trust blindly, he demanded of himself, why the hell me? I wouldn't trust me to tell the time. Still, he couldn't think of anything better, or even anything worse. His mind was completely blank, presumably an after-effect of whatever the Fay had done to him while he was asleep. He thought about it for a moment and decided, let's go for it, just because it's a bloody silly idea and there isn't a hope in hell of it working, and it'll almost certainly make things very much worse. It doesn't mean I shouldn't do it. It's how governments make laws, after all. Step one. As Paul carried out the preparations for step one, he occupied his mind with trying to remember why he'd come down here in the first place. Not the easiest of riddles to solve, but when all was said and done, he'd achieved something by the exercise. He'd learned who Grendel's aunt was. He'd confirmed his suspicion that the Faic Mels was indeed working for the enemy. He'd discovered what the Fae were actually up to, and how they were doing it, using his portable door. It'd have been nice if he could have had just asked someone back in the office, or looked it up on a website or something, but apparently it was a sort of information that you had to pay dearly for, and now at least he had a general idea of what was going on. On a very pleasant change that made. Step two. Paul had heard it said that step two didn't hurt, not that he could understand how anybody could possibly know. He hoped very much that the rumours were accurate for once, since he'd long since faced up to the fact that he didn't so much have a pain threshold as a pain cat flap. Never mind. With his thumbnail, Paul prized open the big blade of his girl guide pocket knife. It had always been stiff, and as usually tore his nail getting the blade out. Then he laid his left hand on his knee, wrist uppermost, and grabbed tight on the piece of string he'd looped round his elbow. At the last moment he closed his eyes, locating what he devoutly hoped was the right vein by feel. This is a bloody stupid idea, he thought, but... but what? Presumably there was a but, but this wouldn't be the plan. Oh, fuck, he thought. I hate having to be me. Then, grinning at the irony implicit in that last thought, Paul slashed the arteries of his left wrist.